Appendices 51 to 73 of Stories of Old Greece and Rome by Emily Kip Baker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Appendices 51 to 73. Appendix 51. The story of Hercules's accepting Arete, virtue, as his guide, the choice of Hercules, may be found in the Tatler, number 97. The Nemean games instituted by Hercules in honour of Jupiter were celebrated at Nemea, a city of Augolis. The most famous statue of Hercules is the Farnese Hercules in the National Museum at Naples. Another well-known piece of sculpture is the infant Hercules strangling a serpent in the Uffizi at Florence. Quite worth the student's consideration are the poems De Enera and Heracles, in the classical but too little read Epic of Hades by Lewis Morris. The following is an extract from the description of the centaur Nessus. Take this white robe, it is costly. See, my blood has stained it but a little. I did wrong, I know it, and repent me. If there come a time when he grows cold, for all the race of heroes wander, nor can any love fix theirs for long, take it and wrap him in it and he shall love again. Appendix 52 Poem The Fortunate Isles by Andrew Lang The following is from Pindar. The Isles of the Blessed, they say, the Isles of the Blessed, are peaceful and happy by night and by day, far away in the glorious west. They need not the moon in that land of delight, they need not the pale, pale star, the sun is bright by day and night, where the souls of the blessed are. They till not the ground, they plough not the wave, they labour not, never, oh, never. Not a tear do they shed, not a sigh do they heave, they are happy for ever and ever. Appendix 53 The chosen device of Charles V of Germany represented the pillars of Hercules, entwined by a scroll that bore his motto, plus ultra. This device, represented on the German dollar, has been adopted as the sign of the American dollar. Appendix 54 The Pygmies were a nation of dwarfs, so called from a Greek word meaning the cubit, or measure of about thirteen inches, which was said to be the height of these people. They lived near the sources of the Nile, or, according to others, in India. Homer tells us that the cranes used to migrate every winter to the Pygmies' country, where they occasioned a fierce warfare. H. M. Stanley, in his last African expedition, discovered a race of diminutive men that correspond very well in appearance to those mentioned by Homer. Terra is the same goddess as Gaea, the earth. Poem Battle of Pygmies and Cranes by James Beattie Appendix 55 The apples of the Hesperides may have been suggested by the oranges of Spain. See the poem, The Golden Apples, in William Morris's Earthly Paradise. Appendix 56 Two poems on the Medusa, which are well worth reading, are The Doom of King Acrisius, in William Morris's Earthly Paradise, and Shelley's lines on the Medusa of Leonardo da Vinci, in the Florentine Gallery. Appendix 57 There are translations of Simonides' Lament of Danae by William C. Bryant and John H. Freire. Tennyson has a singular use of the proper noun in the Princess when he says, Now lies the earth all Danae to the stars, and all thy heart lies open unto me. Appendix 58. Cassiopeia was said to have been an Ethiopian, and was therefore, in spite of her boasted beauty, black. Milton alludes to her in Il Penseroso as that starred Ethiop queen that strove to set her beauty's praise above the sea nymphs and their powers offended. Though Cassiopeia attained the honour of being set among the stars, she was placed, through the efforts of the sea nymphs, in a part of the heavens near the pole, where she is half the time held with her head downward to teach her humility. Appendix 59 for a Gaelic Andromeda and Perseus see the thirteenth son of the king of Erin in Curtin's Myths of Ireland. Poem Andromeda 
by Charles Kingsley. Appendix 60 From the incident of Bellophoron's bearing to Iobates, the letter that contained his own death warrant, came the expression, Bellerophontic letters. This is used to describe any written message that a person may deliver unknowingly, and that is prejudicial to himself. On Mount Helicon, the home of the Muses and Pegasus, was the fountain of Hippocrene, which was opened by a kick from the hoof of Pegasus. Poems Pegasus in Pound by Henry W. Longfellow Bellerophon in Argus and in Lycia by William Morris Pegasus in Harness by Schiller Appendix 61 The most famous soothsayer was Melampus, who was also the first mortal endowed with prophetic powers. The story is told that before his house stood an oak tree containing a nest of serpents. The old serpents were killed by some servants, but Melampus took care of the young ones, and fed them carefully. One day, when he was sleeping under the oak tree, the serpents licked his ears with their tongues, and when he awoke he was surprised to find that he now understood the languages of birds and creeping things. In this way he was able to foretell future events, and he became a celebrated soothsayer. Once Melampus was taken captive and put into prison, but he overheard the woodworms saying that the timbers of the prison were so nearly eaten through that the roof would soon fall in. He told this to his captors, who immediately took advantage of the warning and left the building, but not before they rewarded Melampus by setting him free. Appendix 62 The best description of Hercules's lament for Hylas is in Lang's translation of the thirteenth idyll of Theocritus. Poem. Hylas by Bernard Taylor. The naming of Jason's ship may have been after its builder, or from the city of Argos, or from the word Argo, meaning swift or white. The story of the simple Gades might be a reference to the rolling and clashing of icebergs. The dove incident occurs in many ancient stories, from that of Noah down. Poems. Talking Oak by Alfred Tennyson. Life and Death of Jason by William Morris Aeson and King Athamas by Frederick Tennyson Appendix 63 Medea's preparations for her magic potion are like the incantations of the witches in Macbeth, Act 4, Scene 1. Round about the cauldron go, in the poisoned entrails throw. Fill it of a fenny snake, in the cauldron boil and bake, eye of newt and toe of frog, wool of bat and tongue of dog, adder's fork and blind worm's sting, lizard's leg and howlet's wing. Witch's mummy, maw and gulf, of the ravin's salt sea shark, root of the hemlock digged in the dark, etc. Appendix 64 Medea's sorceries were assisted by the prayers that she addressed to Hecate a mysterious divinity who embodied the terrors of the darkness. She haunted crossroads and graveyards, and, being goddess of sorcery and witchcraft, wandered only by night and was seen only by dogs, whose barking told of her approach. Translations of the Medea of Euripides are by Augusta Webster, William C. Lawton, and Wadhull. Appendix 65 Poems on Atalanta Atalanta's Race in the Earthly Paradise by William Morris Atalanta in Calydon by Algernon C. Swinburne Hippomenes and Atalanta by Walter S. Landor Appendix 66 Daedalus shared with Aeolus the honour of inventing sails for the ships hitherto propelled by oars. Daedalus could never bear the idea of a rival, and when his nephew Perdix was apprenticed to him, the lad gave such promise of excelling his teacher in mechanical arts that Daedalus grew to hate him. One day, when Perdix was walking on the seashore, he picked up the spine of a fish, and later on he imitated it in iron, thus inventing the saw. He also invented a pair of compasses. Then Daedalus, envious of his nephew's skill, pushed him off a tower and killed him. But Minerva, pitying the boy, changed him into a partridge, which bears his name. Appendix 67. Castor and Pollux were deities of boxing, wrestling, and all equestrian exercises. They were generally seen mounted on snow-white horses, 
and their appearance on the battlefield was a good omen for the army among whom they came. The Romans believed that they fought at the head of their legions at the famous battle of Lake Regillus. Appendix 69 Poems Theseus and Hippolyta by Walter S. Landor Ariadne by Frederick Tennyson Hippolytus of Euripides by Algernon C. Swinburne Phaedra by Algernon C. Swinburne Phaedra in the Epic of Hades by Lewis Morris Appendix 70 The story of Oedipus is taken from the Oedipus Rex, Oedipus Colonius, and Antigone of Sophocles, translations of Plumptry or of Lewis Campbell. Other poems Swellfoot the Tyrant by Percy B. Shelley, The Downfall and Death of King Oedipus by Edward Fitzgerald, Antigone by Aubrey de Vere, The Sphinx by Ralph W. Emerson, Fragment of an Antigone by Matthew Arnold. Appendix 71. In her Characteristics of Women, Mrs. Jameson has compared the character of Antigone with that of Cordelia in Shakespeare's King Lear. The scene of Oedipus going alone into the forest at Colonus is similar in pathos and tragedy to Lear's defiance of the midnight tempest on the lonely heath. Appendix 72. For references in poetry to the Judgment of Paris. Judgment of Paris by James Beattie. Judgment of Paris by John Stuart Blackie. Enoni by Alfred Tennyson. Appendix 73. Other minor deities not mentioned in the text are Victoria, Nike, goddess of victory, Phosphor, the morning star, Hesperus, the evening star, god of the west, Hygeia, a daughter of Aesculapius, watched over the health of man. The Graces, daughters of Jove, presided over banquets, dances, and also social pleasures and polite accomplishments. They were three in number, Euphrosyne, Aglaea and Thalia. They are also called Gratiae. Momus was the god of laughter. The Seasons were the four daughters of Jupiter and Themis. Their collective name was Hore, the Hours. As the Hours they attended the sun car of Apollo. Fama, goddess of fame. Faunus, god of fields and shepherds. He was also gifted with prophetic powers. Fauna, the sister, wife, or daughter of Faunus. She was also called the Bona Dea. Pales, a deity who presided over cattle and pastures. Manes, the souls of the departed who had become deified. End of Appendices 51 to 73. Recording by Kevin Green. End of Stories of Old Greece and Rome by Emily Kip Baker.